Tonight on The Edge, the deadly consequences of drunk driving. An innocent man loses his life after getting struck and hit by um, in a hit and run driver in Warren. Fox News' Dave Kinchin has more on the life that was lost. Well, a criminal investigation is underway. There are certainly heavy hearts in the Warren and Sterling Heights communities here. A person lost who touched so many lives. It's just a sad, sad situation what had happened, and we're all so sick about it. Shirley McClintock remembers her dear friend, 42 year old Jerry Lowry, struck and killed by an alleged drunk driver. She says he would have turned 43 on Tuesday of this week. He was like my little angel because anytime you needed him, he was always there. If I needed my grass cut or my gutters cleaned or whatever, he, he would do it all the time. He was a loving person. Sources say Lowry was hit around 4 a.m. July 30th at Globe and Nine Mile in Warren, where a memorial marker now stands. He was on his way home, and uh, he was like bent over, uh, I guess looking at the bike. And and the woman, the the, the witness that saw it. She, she saw him, so she passed him, but then all of a sudden she heard a bang and then something up that flew up in the air, a real loud noise. So that's probably when she hit him. So then the woman, she saw that it, it was a hit and run, so she followed her and um, got her license number and reported it to the police and then went back to his body and uh, put her car so that he wouldn't get hit again. Investigative sources say charges have been handed down, but the case is still being worked on. Friends say they now have a huge hole in their hearts. I hope he's in the arms of our Lord. I'm sure he is. Received another angel in heaven. And we're working to get the latest details on this investigation from the investigators, and we'll put that information out as we get it. Dave Kinchin on the Edge. An unbelievable story about a suspected impaired driver in Livingston County. We're told family members of a 45-year-old Deerfield Township woman hadn't heard from her since Saturday. On Monday evening, her 2022 Ford Bronco was discovered crashed against a tree on a private property on Mack Road in Deerfield Township, but the woman was nowhere to be found. Livingston County deputies, EMS Hamburg Township Police, Heartland and Green Oak firefighters, along with canines and drones, were all deployed to search 200 acres in hopes of finding the missing woman. She was finally located last night in a cornfield nearly a mile from the accident scene. She was alive but had extensive injuries from the accident and exposure to the elements. The woman was not wearing a seatbelt when it crashed, when she crashed, and drugs and alcohol are being investigated as factors in the accident. You know, there are some stories that filter into the Fox 2 newsroom that shock even the most veteran journalists. And tonight, Fox 2's Jessica Dupnek tells us about a Taylor woman who was charged with having sex with her dog. When I got the tip on this situation, I really thought I'd heard it all. I didn't believe it until the details were laid out in court. Yes, a woman accused of having sex with the family dog, and it was apparently caught on home surveillance cameras. Now she's charged with sodomy and animal abuse. Ever seen anything like this? I have not. You probably have not either. It all started like this. A gentleman comes in the front desk like uh, they do all day, every day. Like the beginning of a bad joke that turned terrible. She did own up to performing these acts on, on Max. The Taylor man says this week he caught his ex-girlfriend Brittany McClure on home surveillance cameras at their Taylor home they still share. In that video, it shows defendant Brittany McClure lying on the living room floor on a, what appears to be a mattress covered with a blanket. She then removes the blanket and calls the dog over to her. That's Taylor PD's detective Philip Collop, who had to analyze the six minute video. She is heard saying good boy. He secured charges against McClure for sodomy and animal abuse. Max is even named as the victim in his report. Plain as day, it's his ex-girlfriend performing uh, fellatio on the dog named Max and um, her attempts to, to get Max to reciprocate. Lieutenant Frank Canning at this job 24 years, he's dumbfounded, says McClure confessed and even told investigators why. Kind of a uh, interest in a fetish, uh, stuff that was seen on the internet. Good news, Max was not hurt. Yes, Max is fine. He uh, is 
in the custody of his uh, dad, uh, Brittany's ex-boyfriend. No contact with any animals. The judge setting a $100,000 personal bond. McClure apparently says this is the first time she's ever done this. I would like to think that Max is going to be uh, in good hands and there's no threat to this happening again. Now McClure, she does not have any criminal record. Part of the reason she got a personal bond. Now a side note on those cameras, they were put up not because that ex-boyfriend had any suspicion. They were put up for security reasons. Jessica Dupnack, Fox 2 News. A pivotal day in court. A judge sends a man to trial for the death of his cousin, Zion Foster. And for the first time, we hear the videotape confession to the crime itself. So I freaked out. I was like, this is terrible. It was very bad. I didn't know what to do. I took her. I put her to my trunk. And I took her to hide the park. And put her inside of a chest can in our land. That's Jalen Brazier confessing to police shortly after Zion Foster disappeared. Brazier claims he panicked when Zion died, which he says happened after smoking marijuana in his home in Detroit. In today's second day of testimony, more evidence was laid out with text messages, doorbell cameras, and Google searches. The judge reprimanded Brazier, calling him a liar. Come look at the camera. She was not here. Everybody stop saying she's here. Why are they doing this to me? I'm a victim. I'm a victim. How can you have the audacity to do that to somebody who is related to you, somebody that you're supposed to love, somebody that's supposed to be a cousin to you? What kind of sick person must you be? Brazier has already served time for lying to police in the investigation. He was paroled in January. He's once again behind bars tonight. Oh, oh don't hit me. Do not hit me. Oh, they go. A police pursuit caught on cell phone video in Farmington Hills. Yesterday afternoon, five people ran from an SUV after it was stopped in a pit maneuver by police at Middle Belt and Grand River. We're told one person was detained right away and a second suspect was arrested while trying to get into another vehicle. Three suspects remain at large. You can see their images in these surveillance pictures. Call Farmington Hills PD if you know who they are. I heard uh, a couple shots, but I wasn't going out there because bullets don't have no name. Gunshots fired inside a Southfield neighborhood and the pursuit for the suspects ends right in front of the Fox 2 studio. Sometimes the news comes right to us. We're told several shots were fired at Fairfax near 10 Mile and Greenfield. Now police are still working to find out who shot at who, but we're told a gun was located inside the Dodge Charger in front of Fox 2 on 9 Mile, and that one person in the vehicle is currently on probation. No injuries were reported. Well, after uh, finally getting our nice days, uh, future forecast showing a little bit of rain. Yeah, a little bit of rain. I guess uh, we expect that during the seventh year. Meteorologist Derek Kevra tells us when we can expect it. Hey there, Derek. Hey, guys. It looks like we're going to be dealing with kind of on again, off again showers into the weekend. I think the weekend looks mostly okay. Friday night, early Saturday morning. That's going to be our key window to see some heavier rain, maybe even some thunderstorms. Could start as early as Friday evening. In fact, we're not even in the clear completely uh, as we move through tomorrow. Even Thursday has some spotty showers. Notice those temperatures, mostly in the 80s through the weekend, and then we dip down into the upper 70s. As we move into next week, we are going to see some of this cooler air that's been bottled up in Canada start to leak down, and it could drop our temperatures at times next week, and then almost certainly as we head into not this weekend, but next weekend. So just a long-range forecast for you right there. In terms of any rain showers, we're seeing them stuck into northern Ohio. We knew that was going to happen, but it's interesting how it does almost feel like there's some magical force keeping it just down there, although maybe a few sprinkles in Monroe County. I think a lot of us are dry as we move overnight. Watch Thursday afternoon. You can see a few of those little specks of green. Not a huge deal, but we might see some of that. So we're going to say a chance for some showers on Thursday. Check it out Friday night, Saturday morning. That's our window for most activity. Then the rest of the weekend looking better as we move into next week. Things do look a little bit more damp with some thunderstorms possible as we head into Monday. Literally for decades, we have been discharging uh, combined sewer overflows after heavy rain events. Major upgrades are underway in Macomb County to keep sewage out of Lake St. Clair. Tens of millions of dollars will overhaul the Chapitan pump station and the retention treatment basin to handle an additional 13 million gallons. 
The goal is to keep sewage contained during a major rain event and out of not only the lake, but also nearby basements. The money comes from the American Rescue Plan. Well, the warning for Detroiters who haven't been keeping up on water bills after a three-year moratorium, the city will resume water shutoffs for those who are high in debt. According to the Detroit Water and Sewage Department, service interruptions will start with those who owe more than $5,000, are not enrolled in a payment plan, and live in middle to high income areas. Right now, 7,000 households are at risk of shutoffs. To get into a payment plan, reach out to the Detroit Water and Sewage Department as soon as you can. More demo is coming to Detroit. The city is going to take down more than 20 vacant schools that have become dangerous eyesores in the communities. We're told the Blight to Beauty Initiative assessed 63 vacant historic age school properties to evaluate which should be knocked down and which could be preserved for redevelopment. Some of the old schools that will be torn down include Monier Elementary, Sherrill Elementary, Hanneman Elementary, and Crockett High School.